Hi, I'm Ken Ward, and this is Mining Biblical Truth. It's great to be back with you this week to get into our second week of the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 4 through 7. just want to quickly remind you of these resources that I mentioned uh, last week and credit them with a lot of the information that I'm sharing with you. Also, I want to remind you of what I showed you last week of the chiasm of chapters 1 through 7, because we're now in the second part um, after the turning point of Samuel's call. But within that part, there's another chiasm. <laughs> it's a chiasm within a chiasm. And in 4 through 7, the turning point is the return of the ark. What we'll see in this passage is that really this all centers around uh, the ark as the presence of God. On either side of this, we have the ark in Philistia with causing plagues, and then the ark at Beth Shemesh in Israel also causing plagues, and then the ark captured and exiled to Philistia, and then the ark is, ex in a sense, exiled to Kiriath Jerim. And at the beginning, we have the great battle of Aphek with the physical presence of the ark and a Philistine victory. At the end, we have the battle uh, that leads up to, it's not at Ebenezer, but it leads up to the creation of Ebenezer by Samuel. And the, the battle is without the ark, but with the spiritual presence of the Lord. And it results in Israelite victory. So I'm calling this uh, the theme here, trusting God. Our aim is to learn that God is holy and only he can be trusted. And we're going to concentrate on the Hebrew roots uh, that transliterated into English letters would be like KBD or KVD. And these uh, uh, form uh, six words, three verbs, two nouns, and an adjective. Kavad means it is, uh, or is something that is on you, and it means to weigh heavily upon. Kaved is the verb means it defines you, to be glorious, honorable, or weighty. Kavad is something you receive, and this is, means honor or glory. Kibed is something you give, you give honor to. Kibud is an adjective, it means you proclaim it in a way that's honoring. And Kaved is something you carry, it's a mass or a weight. So we have here a concentration on weight, glory, and honor. And we'll see how these are related. Eli and his sons gain weight physically while losing honor and failing to glorify God. Eli refuses to exert any weight on his evil sons, so the Lord dishonors Eli with a weighty prophecy of lost glory. Eli and his sons were not holy and could not be trusted. While they lose honor, Samuel gains honor as he glorifies the Lord through obedience. Psalm 115.1 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto to thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. So, they choose to gather at Ebenezer. Well, Every time you see a name in the Bible, you should ask yourself why it's there. And Ebenezer means stone of help. So they thought if we gather where the Lord helps, then he will help us. You'll have to. If the stone did not help, as it did in here, then maybe the ark and the sons of the priests will ensure victory. So they bring those. Disaster follows as Eli's dying daughter-in-law uh, the end names her son e Kabod. There's that word Kabod for glory. It means, where is the glory? Because the ark is gone and her husband and father-in-law are dead and her brother-in-law. Remember that they are still in the era of the, ju of the judges when, quote, everyone did what was right in their own eyes, unquote. Why should the symbol of the Lord's glory, his mercy seat of judgment, 
remain with people who fail to give him glory. Note that the bad news is brought by an unnamed man from Benjamin who escaped the battle. Was this perhaps a relative of the future King Saul? These Benjamites keep showing up in Judges and Samuel at opportune moments. Truth here is that a holy God cannot be manipulated. And for application, how are we trying to manipulate God? A holy God can be trusted to honor holiness, as in 1 Peter 1, 16, Be holy, for I am holy. A God who can be manipulated is not a God who can be trusted. So why would we want that? The irony here is that the people deserve exile, but God instead, symbolically, exiles the symbol of his presence. This will serve two purposes. One, cause the people to repent and return to behavior and worship that glorifies God. And two, God's ark in exile will achieve what the people could not do. So the Philistines uh, believe that they can force Yahweh to worship Dagon. They put him in Dagon's temple. And symbolically, Dagon falls over, loses his head, which would be simple, a symbol of his ability to reason, and his hands, symbols of his ability to act. In the place where they hung the heads of conquered enemies, their God loses his head. Now, there are many allusions I'm sure you saw uh, to the Egyptians of the Exodus, and this is referenced actually by the Philistine, Philistine prince, priests themselves when they, they warn uh, the kings not to harden their hearts like Pharaoh. The presence of the one true God brings plagues and display the powerlessness of false gods. Remember that the Philistines are descendants uh, of the Egyptians. Now, the five cities of the Philistines is interesting as a number. It's an echo of the five cities of the sinful cities of the plain of the Jordan in Genesis, where Lot lived. An enclave of pagans that caused trouble for God's people. There's also an interesting future prophecy in Isaiah 19.18 that says, In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan and swearing allegiance to the Lord of hosts. And one will be called the city of destruction. So one of those mystery future prophecies. Now, the ark did not work out as a slave to Dagon. And like the slaves of the Exodus, it must be sent back with gifts. The ingenious test of the, of the Lord's will for the ark is that cows not accustomed to pulling a wagon and are in a stage of feeding their calves are not going to go naturally anywhere with that wagon. Therefore, the cause of their actions must be supernatural. Certainly the Philistines here are um, acting wisely. So, they go up to Beth Shemesh, so we should ask ourselves, why this town? And why go to a Joshua there? Well, the city was given to the Levites. <clears throat> so, the symbols in here may be that they should know how to handle the ark. They were, the three tribes of the uh, uh, Levites were in, in charge of three different aspects of taking apart and carrying the tabernacle and ark. And then Joshua is the namesake of, of course, Joshua who co conquered the land, or the Lord used to conquer the land. And Joshua knew how to honor the Lord. So maybe this Joshua would be the same. Or maybe not. And then it says the men there looked at the ark and were struck down, dead. It's the same word as strike with plague. Now, surely the Philistines must have looked at the ark, and there's no record of them dying instantly. So what is this talking about? Well, we can only speculate here, but I think it's one of two things. Uh, one may be that they took the mercy seat uh, lid off of the ark 
in order to see the tablets of the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff, and the jar of manna inside. Even the chief priest was not allowed to do that. Remember, he was the only one who was supposed to lay eyes on the ark, and then only once a day on the on the Day of Atonement. Now, the other possibility is that they may, if they if they knew how to handle the ark properly, the first thing they would have done when it came to them was to find something to cover it with so no one would look at it. So the error could have been just the fact that they didn't do that or that they did cover it, but then some of these men uh, lifted the cover to look at it, and that's why they died. In any case, they clearly were doing things not according to the law. And they sacrificed cows instead of bulls, which of course is what they were supposed to do. Uh, these images just show you uh, what uh, images of the ark being covered when it was carried. When it was taken apart in the tabernacle, uh, Aaron and his sons would remove the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, and then they would lay it across uh, the ark to hide it, and then the Levites could come and carry it on the poles. Uh, I've been to uh, Ethiopia where they believe that they're hiding the, the true ark, and they have this uh, annual celebration called Timket, where they used to bring out supposedly the real ark, but always covered. Uh, but now they bring out a little chest as a symbol of the ark, uh, but they don't uh, expose the real ark, which you can't go and see. But uh, like a lot of people that have been there, I'm pretty convinced they that they probably do have the real ark. Uh, but the question here for us to, to ask ourselves is, what sacred ritual could we mishandle today? And the one that comes to mind for me is communion. Paul warned the Corinthians regarding their perversion of communion. For instance, if your church allows anyone to take communion, whether they've made a commitment to the Lord or not, maybe you need to rethink that. Paul said, let a person examine himself and then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I think it means we're supposed to always examine uh, our own sins and repent before taking communion. And how did the people react? Well, they send it away, just like the Philistines. So these Levites are no more holy than the Philistines. The perverted priests and Levites are a repeating theme in Judges Samuel, starting with no one less than the grandson of Moses in the story of Dan and Judges. So they asked the people of Kiriath Jerim to take it. Well, again, why? Why them? Well, this was a city of the Gibeonites, who are not Israelites. Remember, they're the ones who tricked Joshua into the sinful treaty in uh, Judges. Uh, so this place is like a mini version of being in the wilderness. It's an island of wilderness within the land. It is like the wilderness because the slave has been freed. The ark has been freed from the Philistines, but it's not entered the promised land. because they are not ready for it. And amazingly, it remains there at the home of Abinadad all the way up until David conquers Jerusalem. A very long time ahead. So we're told in 7-2 that 20 years pass. So what's happening during this time? Well, if you watch my uh, presentation on the period of the judges, I talked about uh, the theory that the judges, uh, periods of the judge judgeships overlaps. And it especially overlaps in this period right before and after 1100 BC. We have the, all of these judges here in red, and then we have, most importantly, Samson and Eli. And Sam, and then the early part of Samuel overlapping. So this line here at the end of Eli would be uh, the death uh, of Eli occurring a little past halfway through Samson's judgeship. Uh, now what that would allow is that since uh, the uh, 
Samson's uh, judgeship in life end when he brings the 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 roof of uh, the temple to Dagon uh, crashing down, and this occurs in the city of Gaza, unlike the earlier event in Ashdod. So first the Dagon gets beheaded in Ashdod, and then maybe fifteen years later or so, um, Dagon and his followers uh, get their heads crushed uh, in Gaza. So perhaps this this event uh, was a uh, catalyst for the people to repent and turn back. Both Eli uh, and Samson and their jumpsuits uh, are are blind men, but Samson gets revenge. And anytime you have crushing of the heads, it should make you think about the prophecy of the son of the woman crushing the head of the serpent. And then Samuel gathers the people to repent and reject false gods. True repentance requires feeling the weight of our sins, showing honor to God and seeking to glorify him by being living images of him. So you can see how these words relate to each other. And when you saw them in Hebrew, you would see it even to greater degree because they sound alike. Jesus transfers the weight of our sins onto himself and shares his glory with us. And for this, we honor him. The prior battle of affect is now reversed. Now the Israelites are in fear, but choose to trust the Lord. And the Lord thunders, important word, and confuses the Philistines, allowing the Israelites to slaughter them. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up, and for he said, Till now the Lord has helped us, and he called it Ebenezer. Now this is a new, Eben, a new Ebenezer location, not the same one as before. The new stone is not a stone of manipulation, but a stone of remembrance of salvation, of thankfulness. And this should take us back to Hannah's prophecy, which comes true here. First Samuel 2, 4, the bows of the warriors are broken, but those who have stumbled are armed with strength because they repented. And in verse 10, those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will, what? Thunder from heaven against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and will give power to his king. He will exalt the horn of his anointed, which points perhaps in the short term to Samuel, but uh, later to David and uh, Solomon, and of course, ultimately to Jesus. The Lord is given glory, Samuel is honored, and the weight of the Philistines on Israel is lifted. A holy God can be trusted to honor those who glorify him. And as a, a illustration, I'll share the, the Robert Robinson story. Robert Robinson was a servant of the Lord for uh, many years, but uh, wandered away from faith and lived a life of sin for a while. And he reached a point of great despair, and he was on a train in Europe. And a young woman uh, sat down uh, next to him, and she asked him, if he would help her in her her study, she didn't know who he was, um, and she handed him a, a hymn that she was trying to interpret for her uh, schoolwork, and the hymn was "Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing," which Robert Robinson wrote. <laughs> and of course, he doesn't really want to deal with this, and. Uh, but he he does share with her. He he said, "I'm not worthy to to review this with you because I've wandered, and I don't feel like the Lord can forgive me." And uh, she says to him, "Are not the streams of the Lord's mercy still flowing?" And he started to cry because he realized that the Lord had sent this young girl to call him back. The rest of the uh, uh, excerpts of the 
Him say, come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Here I raise my Ebenezer. I don't know if this is the only <laughs> hymn that uses the word Ebenezer, but it's the one that sure comes to mind for me. Here that I by thy great help I have come. This Ebenezer, remember, the stone of help. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God chose Robert Robinson and called him back. God chose the Israelites and called them back. Again and again and again. If God has chosen you, then he will call you back. He called me back at age 48 after 34 years of wandering. How well can you trust that the Lord has sealed your heart for his courts above? And for a final think about it, why not choose or make an object as your personal Ebenezer, your stone of remembrance, to remind you to trust your holy God? Dear Lord, we thank you for these uh, amazing scriptures. We thank you for the deep levels of symbolism that you build into your word for us to discover. And we uh, pray that uh, uh, you'll help us to trust you this week and walk in your ways and uh, live in ways that glorify uh, you. In Jesus' name, amen. As usual, we'd love for you to, to subscribe, uh, click a like or share with a friend, communicate with us directly by making comments on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you. Or you can communicate directly at info at biblemining.org. Also, there are PDFs of these presentations available under downloads at the website. Thanks for watching and have a blessed week.